Hello, my name is Carl Galland, and my ICA lecture recital is performing the music of Brahms with a, with a historically inspired creative interpretation. And during the performance aspect of this lecture recital, I will be collaborating with the pianist Evelyn Lamb, and we will be performing the first movement of Brahms's clarinet sonata in E flat major, number two, opus 120. The first movement is Allegro Amabile. Our performance might sound atypical to what you would normally hear in a current day live performance of this work, as in our rendition we will be applying romantic historic performance practice conventions. And I'll talk about some of these conventions um, before playing the recording that we made. Some basic late romantic performance practice conventions. To the modern a uh, classical musician, the need for performance practice techniques in a romantic work might be an unfamiliar concept in itself. Most modern classical musicians associate the Baroque and classical periods with historic performance practice rather than the Romantic period. And romantic performance practice is a relatively new area of research that began around the 1980s with access being fairly limited throughout the United States. I was fortunate enough to become aware of these romantic conventions during my graduate studies at the Eastman School of Music and my lecture recital um, for my doctorate covered Brahms and historical performance practice under the mentorship of Dr. Roger Freitas. Some basic trends during the mid to late Romantic period, so the second half of the 1800s and a little bit of the early 1900s, were flexible tempos rubato usage, misalignment of bass and melody intentionally for expressive purposes, and also general and exact interpretation of notation in an improvisatory way. Um, improvisation itself had fallen out of style generally by the end of the uh, 1800s, but the inexact interpretation of notation um, remained the improvisatory nature of um, if you have eighth notes, is it just straight eighth notes, or are you going to have some come early and use rubato um, according to the music and how you're feeling. During the second half of the 1800s especially, rubato which affects pulse and rubato which does not affect pulse were both in style. And the musicologist Clive Brown explains in his book, Classic Coal and Romantic Performance Practice, 1750 to 1900, that professional performers in all parts of the 19th century played with a less steady pulse than modern performers. And this was also true in comparison to the first half of the century. So in the, um, the second half of the 1800s, rubato usage was very in style. Think about composers and conductors such as Mahler and Liszt. Now a little bit about the intentions um, of Brahms and how he performed and listened to music. His musical intentions um, are actually surprisingly open-minded with regard to artistic interpretation. Brahms himself did not expect performers of his music to play with the same tempo choices for two performers, uh, for two performances. Um, Brahms's playing is described by a contemporary, Franny Davies, the pianist, in, seven, in 1928. She said, quote, free, very elastic and expansive. One felt the fundamental rhythms underlying the surface, surface rhythms in Brahms's playing. A strictly metronomic Brahms is as unthinkable as a hurried, as a fussy or hurried Brahms in passages which must be presented with adventine rhythm. So essentially Davies is saying sometimes Brahms is very strict with his with his beat um, and rhythm and other times he's very free and also keep in mind that since Franny Davies was a contemporary to Brahms, her definition of metronomic would have been different than what our definition of metronomic is.
Now a little bit about um, Brahms and how to interpret his markings. Um, in the book by Michael Musgrave and Bernard D. Sherman, the book Performing Brahms, Early Evidence of Performance Style, they talk about some of these um, tendencies that Brahms had when he played music. And it's thought, it's said that when Brahms had two notes that are slurred, he played them differently than if there were a slur over multiple notes. Um, they say, quote, the slur over several notes does not reduce the value of any of them. It signifies legato. Only over two notes does it reduce the value of the last one. End quote. In other words, Brahms regarded the shortening of... A, he, when he saw a two-note slur, his tendency was to make the second one less than the first one. So you can think of it in terms of either rhythm or just emphasis. Um, when you see a two-note slur in Brahms, you could perhaps emphasize the first note and come back for the second one, or maybe linger on the first note longer than what's notated and have the second eighth note be shorter. Another one of Brahms' markings, um, the crescendo de crescendo, is talked about in uh, Musgrave and Sherman's book. They said that Brahms frequently added time and bars with crescendo de crescendos. And these tempo modifications were made for musical reasons. They said, quote, the sign crescendo de crescendo, as used by Brahms, often occurs when he wishes to express great sincerity and warmth. Allied not only to tone, but to rhythm also, he would linger not on one note alone, but on a whole idea, as if unable to tear himself away from its beauty, end quote. Thus, we know that Brahms' usage of rubato for crescendo de crescendos often added time to the bar. So this was rubato that didn't, that affected the overall pulse, adding time. Um, while I don't have any specific research on what Brahms did for dolce and expressivos, during <clears throat> the 1800s, Carl Cherney has a literature that he published, and he said that, he suggested that performers take a slower tempo when they see the notation expressivo. And, and from current research on 19th century performance practice, basically when you see dolce or expressivo, it's up to the discretion of the performer as to what you want to do, but you should do something different. Um, whether you're changing the tempo going faster or slower, which can be very subtle, but like being on the front side of the beat or the slow on the back side of the beat, or um, playing with more rubato when you see those markings. Before you hear our recording of the first movement of Brahms' second sonata, I just want to mention uh, just a few things about what we, what we did and every time we play this piece it sounds different because we're trying to think of our phrasing as improvisatory and um, but maybe when you are starting to study this work with a romantic performance practice te uh, techniques you can think about the first two measures which has two slurs. The first slur is over several notes and then the second slur is over two notes. And so the very first two notes of the movement, you have a choice that you might make. Do I want the second note of the piece to be played early or do I want it to be late? Because it might be bad performance practice to just play it metronomically. Da, da, di, da, di, da, da, da. It's very metronomically, but maybe the second note could come early, which causes misalignment with the bass for expressive purposes. And then in the second measure, that's a two note slur, so you could emphasize the first note and come back. So something like di, da, di, da, di, da, di, da, da, di, da, di, da, di, da, di, 
da, de, da. That's just a little bit of an idea of how you can have ebbing and flowing within your tempo choices. Um, one, one other thing that we did at, is at diminuendos, some of the important ones, we took time, we added a retardando in addition to diminuendo. And um, some of the expressivos I liked to make extra rubato, um, especially the expressivos in the development section where you're traveling to really distant keys. It's um, so I would take more rubato and when I saw there is one spot where molto dolce is notated in that first movement and that's before the return of the first theme and uh, the recapitulation and we make that pianissimo and soft and take a lot of time right there. So molto dolce, maybe that implies something like retardando in terms of late uh, of romantic performance conventions. We also make a big moment out of some of the crescendo de crescendos. Um, as Brahms said, crescendo de crescendos are moments of great sincerity and warmth, and he often added time to multiple notes in them. So the more important crescendo de crescendos, we add some time to measure and add a lot of rubato. We also take a slower tempo in the coda section of the movement at the tranquillo, um, slower than the tempo that we start the piece with and we start slowing down four measures before that in the um, molto dolce sempre. So these are just some ideas of how you can implement some of these uh, performance practice techniques. We hope that you enjoyed this performance. If you have any questions or want to start a conversation about these topics, please contact me through the ICA directory. Thank you very much and enjoy the performance.